Teaching Reverence for Life by Albert Schweitzer No human being is ever totally and permanently a stranger to another human being. Man belongs to man. Man is entitled to man. Large and small circumstances break in to dispel the estrangement we impose upon ourselves in daily living, and to bring us close to one another, man to man, woman to woman. We obey a law of proper reserve, but that law is bound to give way at times to the rule of cordiality. There is much coldness among men because we do not dare to be as cordial as we truly are. Just as the wave cannot exist for itself, but must always participate in the swell of the ocean, so we can never experience our lives by ourselves, but must always share in the experiencing of life that takes place all around us. The ethics of reverence for life requires that all of us somehow, and in some thing, shall act as men towards other men. Those who in their occupations have nothing to give as men to other men, and who possess nothing else they can give away, they must sacrifice some of their time and leisure, no matter how sparse it may be. Choose an avocation. The ethics of reverence for life commands an inconspicuous, perhaps a secret, avocation. Open your eyes and seek another human being in need of a little time, a little friendliness, a little company, a little work. It may be a lonely, an embittered, a sick or awkward person for whom you can do something, to whom you can mean something. Perhaps it will be an old person, or a child. Or else, a good cause needs volunteer workers, people who can give up a free evening or run errands for someone. Someone who can list all the uses to which that precious working capital called man can be put. Do not lose heart. Even if you must wait a bit before finding the right thing. Even if you must make several attempts. Be prepared for disappointments also. But do not abandon your quest for the avocation. For that sideline in which you can act as a man for other men, there is one waiting for you, if only you really want it. This is the message of true ethics to those who have only a little time and a little humanity to give. Fortunate are those who listen. Their own humanity will be enriched where, as in moral isolation from their fellow men, their store of humanity would dwindle. Each of us, no matter what our position and occupation, must try to act in such a way as to further humanity. Those who have the opportunity to serve others freely, and personally should see this good fortune as grounds for humility, the practice of humility will strengthen their will to be of service. No one has the right to take for granted his own advantages, not over others in health, in talents, in ability, in success, in a happy childhood or congenial home conditions. One must pay a price for all these boons. What one owes in return is a special responsibility for other lives. All through the world there is a special league of those who have known anxiety and physical suffering. A mysterious bond connects those marked by pain. They know the terrible things that man can undergo. They know the longing to be free of pain. Those who have been liberated from pain must not now think they are completely free again and can calmly return to life as it was before. With their experience of pain and anxiety, they must help alleviate the pain and anxiety of others, insofar as that lies within human powers. 
they must bring release to others, as they received release. He who has experienced good in his life must feel the obligation to dedicate some of his own life in order to alleviate the suffering of another. Technical progress, extension of knowledge, do indeed represent progress, but not in fundamentals. The essential thing is that we become more finely and deeply human. Doing and suffering, we have the chance to prove our mettle to people who have painfully fought our way to the peace that can never be attained by reason alone. We are headed right when we trust subjective thinking and look to it to yield the insights and truths we need for living. Just as white light consists of colored rays, so reverence for life contains all the components of ethics, love, kindness, sympathy, empathy, peacefulness, and the power to forgive. We must all bid ourselves to be natural and to express our unexpressed gratitude. That will mean more sunlight in the world and more strength for the good. Let us be careful not to incorporate bitter phrases about the world's ingratitude to our philosophy of life. There is much water flowing underground, which is, does not well up from springs. We can take comfort from that. But we ourselves should try to be water that finds its way to a spring, where people can gratefully quench their thirst. Thoughtlessness is to blame for the paucity of gratitude in our lives. Resist this thoughtlessness. Tell yourself to feel and express gratitude in a natural way. It will make you happy, and you will make others happy. The man who has the courage to examine and judge himself makes progress in kindness. It is hard to fight for all of us to become truly peaceable. Right thinking leaves room for the heart to add its word. Constant kindness can accomplish much. As the sun makes the ice melt, kindness causes misunderstandings, mistrust, and hostility to evaporate. The kindness which man pours out into the world affects the hearts and the minds of men. Where there is energy, it will have effects. No ray of sunlight is lost, but the green growth that sunlight awakens needs time to sprout, and the sower is not always destined to witness the harvest. All worthwhile accomplishments act on faith. The thing that truly matters is that we struggle for light to be within us. Each feels the other struggle, and when a man has light within him, it shines out upon others. The great secret is to go through life as an unspoiled human being. This can be done by one who does not cavil at men and facts, but who in all experiences thrown back upon himself and looks within himself for the explanation of whatever happens to him. None of us knows what he accomplishes and what he gives to humanity. That is hidden from us, and should remain so. Sometimes we are allowed to see just a little of it, so we will not be discouraged. The effects of energy are mysterious in all realms. The epithet, mature, when applied to people, has always struck me as somewhat uncomplimentary. It carries overtones of spiritual impoverishment, stunting, blunting of sensibilities. What we usually call maturity in a person is a form of resigned reasonableness. A man acquires it by modeling himself on others, a bit by bit abandoning the ideals and convictions that were precious to him in his youth. He once believed in the victory of truth. Now he no longer does. He once believed in humanity. That is over. He believed in the good. That is over, too. He eagerly sought justice. That is over. He trusted in the power of kindness and peaceableness. That is over. He could become enthusiastic. That is over. In order to steer more safely through the perils and storms of life, 
He has lightened his boat. He has thrown overboard goods that he considered dispensable. But the ballast he dumped was actually his food and drink. Now he skims more lightly over the waves, but he is hungry and parched. Adults are only too partial to the sorry task of warning youth that someday they will view most of the things that now inspire their hearts and minds as mere illusions. But those who have a deeper experience of life take another tone. They exhort youth and try to preserve throughout their lives the ideas that inspire them. In youthful idealism, man perceives the truth. In youthful idealism, he possesses riches that should not be bartered for anything on earth. Those who vow to do good should not expect people to clear the stones from their path on this account. They must expect the contrary, that others will grow and roll great boulders down upon them. Such obstacles can be overcome only by the kind of strength gained in the very struggle, and those who merely resent obstacles will waste whatever force they have.